my first question is typically prof mihai we do a sort of you know what is your background and what is the story etc in 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 your case i find that is quite unnecessary because your famous ted talk has sort of answered how you got into the subject i think what would be great to understand is once you began researching flow and and you've been doing it over such a long time what have been some of the defining moments in that research what have been some of the turning points that you remember well um certainly the very beginning uh, was uh, quite exciting because uh, i was just um, teaching a seminar for college seniors and we decided uh, on the seminar to study um adult play because there wasn't much in the literature on that and also um most of the work even on children's play was very kind of uh, strangely um alienated from the actual phenomenology of play they were uh the assumption was that children play because um if they play chess they can become good engineers and in the, if they play um uh some kind of game of catching each other running after each other that will be healthy for them and they will be um living longer and things of that sort that didn't make any sense to me because i mean kids play because they enjoy it and and it's great fun and they learn from it but it's it's not they don't play to learn they play to um experience uh, what comes with uh playfulness so um in that course in that seminar i asked each student to report on one form of adult play and why people play it etc and what was um really surprising to me after uh this 12 or 15 students came in with their papers and which we discussed together in the class was how similar uh, the experiences they reported were uh, compared to um even though they were very different forms of play that went from gambling to uh playing sports to playing musical instruments but what people were describing seemed to be to me strangely similar in many respects and we tried to figure out what those overlaps were in class and it was a really kind of discovery in many ways of seeing how um there there was an emerging theory an emerging understanding of what makes people want to do something for no good reason except for experiencing the activity itself so that was great after that um it was great when um uh, for instance one of my first letters was uh from my reader who read one of my first articles was um actually from india from um i think uh, calcutta which uh, he was writing saying yeah what you describe is so strangely similar to uh the um discourse that uh, lord shiva has with aryuna in the bhagavad gita and the first chapter and so forth and he um described that as um having and, and he described it to me i never read the bhagavad gita before but after he he um he wrote that i went to read it and in fact it was very exciting to see these ideas coming up in a such a an incredibly different context and then after that a uh, few months later i had a letter from uh, from uh, shanghai from a uh, professor there who said he read my stuff and it reminded him of what lord say used to write about the daoism and so forth and um i mean what became known as daoism <laughs> but um so um i started reading that and i was very impressed by that too and i said gee this is uh, it seems like there is a underlying um knowledge that um seems to have been forgotten uh that uh 
needs to be repolished and re-adapted to modern understandings of how things work and so forth. But it's the same thing, really. And um, so that was very exciting. And then after that, uh, you know, um, my collaboration with colleagues in Italy and, and other parts of Europe and they discovering the same things, and then some of my students um, interviewing people in um, Japan and Korea and so forth. And then my colleague, the first Massimini, who was uh, one of the first to understand uh, the importance of these uh, studies, uh, he, he went also to northern India and um, studied um, people who live up in the mountains um, close to Nepal and, and uh, describing how they have flow and so forth. And so it was very exciting to see the replication of these simple class experiments that we did um, in 1969. We have done so many different studies and each one is interesting in its own way. The last one that we did, we published several articles from, was a study of internet chess and how people play. Uh, and we asked people who played against each other to, this, uh, to fill out how much flow they had in the game afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, we, in a week, we collected over 1,000 games, and um, it it was a good way to study whether our uh, prediction, the hypothesis was that the greatest enjoyment would come when the two players were exactly matched in terms of their skill level, because that means that challenges and skills were yeah. equal for both players. And uh, we found that that was almost true, but um, it was even better if the opponent was about 7% better than you were. Um, uh, so playing against better players was, uh, the curve went down very slowly, whereas uh, the curve of enjoyment. But if you played against the worst player, the... the um, curve went down precipitously. That is, you don't enjoy playing. You enjoy playing someone who is 100 points better than you, but not against somebody who's 100 points lower. Yeah. And that was a, a nice little breakthrough in theory because all psychological theories try, uh, explain play as a way of boosting your self-esteem by winning, and that's the point of the game is to win. And and in fact, uh, it's not. It uh, when you play against somebody that much better than you, you win only about thirty percent of the time. Um, but when you win, you feel much better. <laughs> Whereas if you win against somebody worse than you, you don't feel better. And if you lose, you feel much worse. <laughs> so that that that's um, that was an elegant uh, set of experiments that real life experiments and I, I that was one uh, but there is so many uh, others that um, are interesting and it's um, I was called to uh, uh, to uh, by um, the CEO of a major company in, in Asia who applied flow five, uh, seven years ago, and he was to, to the, the company, and he says that since then they, they made $6.5 billion in profit more than expected. By what, <laughs> what, did he, what did he do, Prof? Would be, uh, yeah. uh, he just had his whole manager's uh, group understand flow uh, by, uh, they had workshops and discussions, and then each one had to apply it to seven of their uh, reports. 
on the uh, yeah reports, and then each one had to do it down. So they had a, a whole pyramid of each person being responsible for making the life of those below them more enjoyable, the work life, and um, either by changing expectations or retraining the person or moving them to a different uh, position until, and to, to do that they use this method that we have been using with experience sampling, which means that you keep track of how you experience uh, the day from every 10, 15 minutes, 10, yeah. and then you can find out what type of work is either boring or anxiety provoking to your reports and you, your responsibility now as manager is to change it and to change the condition of the workers um, the job experience and that lo and behold ends up <laughs> showing up in the bottom line you know wow. as a, that, that, in your profit line yeah. so we had this also with a Swedish company, a major company there, who did the same thing and they they got the same results. So uh, that's kind of exciting to see, although I wish that they would have provided a small percent of their profits uh, to build up our, <laughs> our uh, laboratories here, but, but it's still good to know that it, it works. That's what what counts that people Absolutely. can use it and make it work. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, the the next the next question that I have is very much around sort of video games make use of flow. So if you think of most video games, they are they are wonderful experience wonderful uh, experience because they keep raising the skill level uh, the challenge level as your skills get better. Yeah. But yeah. is there a case for something called meaningful flow? I don't know, flow that contributes to uh, to your growth and development, which in some ways video games do, but I'm guessing there's a diminishing returns after time. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. what is your view view on that? Yeah, unfortunately, there is such thing as what we call junk flow. And junk flow is when you are uh, actually... At becoming addicted to a superficial uh, experience that uh, that is maybe flow at the beginning, but after a while becomes um, uh, something that you uh, become addicted to instead of something that makes you grow. Yeah, and that's. You find that even in chess, for instance, which I, I love and I think it's a very, very um, difficult to exhaust as, as a source of growth. And yet, you find that so many uh, chess masters, when they uh, reach the end of their career, or uh, even young, you know, in their 30s, 40s, but they can't go beyond the... The, uh, the skill level anymore, mm -hmm. uh, then they uh, become essentially um, kind of trapped into, uh, because they haven't learned any other skill usually, they don't see anything else in the world that's challenging to them, and then they are, they have, they are repeating uh, their moves, but without without any ex excitement anymore, really, because it's, they know that they are stuck, they can't grow, and, and so, uh, but it's much more short cycle in, in video games, where, uh, yeah, you can do it faster and faster, and, yeah. and go higher and higher levels, but after a while, either you can't go anymore because you are not fast enough, or you we wake up one morning and say, why the heck am I doing this kind of thing? It's, it just doesn't give me any um, hope for the future, really. I mean, yeah. I, I can't. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, the meaning is, is important, but um, that is, uh, you know, the Greek philosopher Plato wrote, 
2,000 years ago that the um, greatest challenge for teachers and parents is to teach young people to find pleasure in the right things. And that was, he called it pleasure, but actually what he meant more is um, enjoyment. In, in, and the problem is that it's much easier to find pleasure or enjoyment in things that are not growth producing but are attractive and seductive and after a while you get trapped by um, a cycle of uh, short-term burst of excitement and then it becomes a habit and now you you feel bad if you can't play but you don't feel good when you can play you know and, and that that's um, that's the that is a problem that um, goes beyond flow. I mean, it, it exactly. goes to to um, the philosophy of life, you know, and and that that needs to be taken into account. Yeah. Makes sense. So that leads me to my next question. I was going to go to motivation, but you you brought brought up this point about. Uh, pleasure in the right things. And I think you've coined a term called uh, work orientation. Uh, can you just explain a little bit what that is and, and also most importantly how we can cultivate it? Because my, my next couple of questions are very much around work orientation and intrinsic motivation in the sense of can this be taught? Uh, can I mean these are good things, obviously good things to have, but can these be taught to others or and as teachers and parents and if most importantly can be taught to ourselves? So I think it will be great to get your view on both. Yeah, usually I find that people who become intrinsically motivated in the job, whether they're surgeons or uh, cooks in a restaurant or whatever, those people are the people who became, who paid enough attention to what they had to do to discover small differences in performance, small differences in the product uh, of what they were doing, and became fascinated with the possibility of improving on what they were doing. So uh, to do it faster, better, uh, more um, elegantly, with less effort, with um, uh, and you find that these people, once they discover that and they begin to practice what they learned about the job, uh, become attracted to the performance of excellence or uh, whatever else goals they have established for themselves. And then the work becomes intrinsically motivated. Uh, um, um, intrinsic motivation means simply that something that occurs between you and what you are doing becomes uh, worth doing for its own sake. Mm -hmm. And that is easiest to see in activities that are designed to be intrinsically motivating, like dancing, singing, playing the sitar, um, painting, or writing poetry, and these forms of self-expression or self-actualization exist only because of the experience they provide. Then they become associated with other things like paid performance or religious ritual, but basically people are attracted to these things because doing, dancing, singing, playing, instruments is something that allows them to develop a skill that has an immediate um, feedback gives, gives, and you can see yourself improving and expressing what you want to do. So it, the activity becomes a form of self-expression of, of this is who I am, this is what I do, I can do, etc. And when that happens, the work becomes intrinsically motivating, which means that even if you are paid for it or even if you get other 
rewards for it, it also very importantly gives you this sense of uh, this is who I am, this is what I can do well, and this is what I am called to do. Uh, you know, the calling, the notion of um, having a, a calling, of being called to do something, and again, that's what uh, Shiva told Aryuna, you know, I mean, uh, this is what you are, this is what you have to do, you know, and so, uh, um, if you, that can become, of course, if you know that you are being exploited, that somebody is using your skills for some other purpose for themselves, then you become alienated, as uh, Marx knew very well, that alienated labor is, is um, a way of feeling that you're self is being sucked up away by somebody else and it's it's uh, for their own purposes and that's then work is no longer intrinsically motivating and yeah anyway and and, and many people you know um, become doctors and surgeons because they feel that this is what they should do and can do well, and they are intrinsically motivated. But then, um, either because of external reasons or because they are not changing, they are not growing in their profession, they become, essentially, they do it because they get paid for it. Yeah. But, but then, the motivation, without, you're a doctor without intrinsic motivation becomes pretty soon a bad doctor. Mm. Uh, he's not paying attention to the uh, patient anymore. He's not, uh, he's not interested in, in curing the patient. He's interested in getting the, Paycheck. <laughs> the patient to pay, you know, and to stay with him. But, and then the doctor usually ends up needing to take um, a little bit of opium on the side or, or you know, a, a, some kind of uh, way of making their, their life more interesting. And, and then, you know, this we find that uh, many surgeons go through that, unfortunately, that spiral, you know, and um, even though their job, they describe it as a pure flow experience. You know, so. Can this can this be taught when you're young though, as or from teachers and parents, uh, or even to ourselves, Prof. Mihai? Well, yeah, I think uh, usually you learn that uh, either by being impressed how another an adult has a good life and an enjoyable life because and partly because they like their job, and then they try to figure out well. How can I do that? And uh, that's where one-on-one -on -one mentoring kind of or apprenticing can be very important. Um, sometimes you learn that by accident, by being in a fortunate enough situation where suddenly you are doing work that is so interesting that you say, oh, uh, this this is what work is about, and you try to learn it. But I don't think you can learn it from books very well, you know. I don't think. Uh, but once you experience it, um, you know you know it. <laughs> you don't have to be explained. And so it it's really a question of experiential learning, you know, being able to. Uh, Fair enough. So, uh, Prof. Mia, this is so interesting. I have so many more questions, but I, I also know I'm running out of time. So, I, I'm going to ask you a couple couple of quick ones. Uh, are there any books or movies that you've been very inspired by or you you really liked um, that, that you'd recommend? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are so many. It would be really hard to, to, um, to um, especially books. I mean, there are so many that are very good that... Um, but, um, and it, they are good at the time, sometimes, uh, you know, you 
for long periods you read uh, detective stories because you are too busy thinking about other things and then finally you get a good book of poems or a good um, good novel and, and then you luxuriate it in reading that but um, but there are too many and <laughs> movies uh, even there I mean I like um, your name, for instance, uh, the Riders of Rohan, who <laughs> take part in the Lord of the Rings, I think. Uh, that's um, That was a, a good movie. It's one of the movies we watched more often, more often with my wife. Uh, um, we have uh, cassettes, of course, and DVDs, and watch those occasionally, those, and... Um, um, but there were, you know, in different stages of life, you know, there were um, the Italian realist movies uh, with the Sika and so forth, and, and of course Fellini's movies, um, so, uh, not the latest movies, the, the last three or four were not very good, but, but his early movies were, were very good, and... Um, and even, you know, um, we saw twice uh, the Slumdog Billionaire <laughs> uh, uh, was a good movie. And we, you know, we are old-fashioned in the sense that we, we like movies that um, have a message of uh, human, humane <laughs> uh, uh, feeling and sensitivity without becoming kitschy or, or you know, um, happy-go-lucky movies, no. Uh, unless they're comedies, uh, a good comedy is always fun. But, uh, um, but, um, yeah. Wonderful. It brought me high. Last, second last question and quick one. You are, you are obviously so productive just because, you know, papers after papers, book, books after books and so much good work. I'd love to know if there's any sort of routines or rituals or little things that you do in a day that help you become more productive. No, I'm trying to become less productive all the time now, <laughs> but, uh, but I can't help it. I, I get asked to do so many things and uh, I just, um, I like to try new things and uh, for instance next month I have to, let's see, I have to fly to several parts in the U.S. but then I have to go to Kazakhstan, okay. uh, uh, to Astana, to lecture there, then to Moscow in Russia, then to Sydney in Australia then come back for a little while, but then I have to go to Amsterdam uh, and then Vienna and then Berlin. And uh, I don't, <laughs> it's, uh, it used to be fun to do this, but now it's, it's getting harder because, you know, I'm, um, this year I will be 80 years old and traveling is not so much fun anymore. And, and going in new hotels every time and carrying bags and stuff like that. Um, but it's fun to work with young students who um, we have a, now a doctoral program in positive psychology, which I started. It's the only one in the world so far. But they are doing good work, good, interesting research that is really fun to help with and encourage them and teach them and uh, and then write some things together occasionally and so forth and it's it's so it's um, on the one hand I enjoy every part of it but on the other I feel <laughs> that less of it could be better by now but anyway. <laughs> It's still a nice place to be, Professor. You, you look you look so young for eighty, right? It must be all the it must be all the activity that's keeping you young as well. <laughs> so, so, so final question: What is an idea that inspires you that you would like to share? The idea that inspired me. Well, mostly anything that inspired me, I wrote about. <laughs> And so it's out there, I think, in the in the books. I um, I do 
you know, I, I had inspirations from so many places. I mean, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I discovered uh, um, a little passage in Dante Alighieri's book, The Monarchia, which was written in 1317, so 700 years ago. And, um, and he says, you know, that every being um, uh, enjoys most of all expressing itself or himself or but it's true uh, when i read that i realized for instance we have do we had dogs for a long time and each dog was the happiest when it did what it was bred to do you know the hunting dog like to hunt the guard dogs like to keep people away from the door the sheep dog uh, loves to to chase big children around until they get together like like a flock of sheep or whatever so and when they do that they look happy you know contented uh, proud uh, and so forth and that that's one one thing that um, I think is something that we forget that that you know happiness is not something that is guaranteed that, that comes with with our birth certificate it's a possibility that we have to discover how to be it and 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 what really happiness is is to do things that are, are harmonious with who we are with what we can do with what we like with what we see around us that we like and we think is right, do it. Not not figure that somebody else will do it or that you don't have a right to do it. No, uh, if you if you miss that opportunity to express yourself, to be you know, in not as a showman who's expressing, you know, right? but if you are. A, if you like to think alone in a mountain top, then that's how you express yourself. That's what you should be doing. And so anyway, that I think is uh, a recurring theme that comes occasionally. I get re-inspired because I discovered that somebody had already seen that hundreds of years ago and it's kind of nice to say, oh yeah, People can were able to penetrate the the veils of Maya and and see these things a long time ago. And, and anyway, okay, so <laughs> that's what. I... Prof Mihai, that, that was wonderful. I took much longer thanks to a combination of IT troubles and just there's so much interesting stuff from what you had to say. Uh, but okay. thank you so much.